Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I'm Ferman. Today we're going to be talking about the things that you need to know before you can buy what is an amazing vehicle, the second generation Lexus GT. First, both for the sake of clarity and also for those of you who aren't familiar with the GS300 engine bay, here is a general depiction of things that you want to inspect when you're under the hood. We have the radiator, power steering fluid reservoir, engine oil dipstick, transmission fluid dipstick, brake fluid reservoir, and the oil filler cap. First, we will inspect the radiator along with its hoses. The plastic radiator housing that you can see in the picture should be black in color. It turns brownish when it is old, like this. This needs to be replaced. Moving on to the hoses. This is the upper radiator hose. And this is the lower radiator hose. To inspect the hoses, feel them. They should be firm but not hard. It should also not be spongy or soft. There also should not be any cracks or swollen spots on the hoses. Now is a good time to clean off any of the existing debris or fluids around the upper or the lower radiator hoses so that once you are done with your test drive, you can check back and see if any coolant has leaked out. Now we will check the condition and the level of the fluid in the coolant overflow reservoir. The manufacturer's recommended coolant for this car is Toyota Super Long Life Coolant, which is pink in color. If the fluid looks milky in color, then there may be oil mixed in the coolant, which may be due to a blown head gasket. The coolant level should be in between the two lines labeled full and low. Now we will move on to the power steering fluid reservoir. Remove the dipstick, wipe off and reinsert into the reservoir. The level of the fluid should be in the area marked hot if the car has been driven or cold if it has sat overnight. To check the condition of the power steering fluid, drop a little of the fluid onto your hand or onto a paper towel. The manufacturer recommended power steering fluid for this car is Dextron 3 automatic transmission fluid. It should be red in color and free of any kind of particles. If the fluid is yellow or amber like this, then the previous owner may have used regular power steering fluid. This will require a complete flush and replacement of the fluid as a wrong kind of fluid may cause degradation of seals in the power steering rack. Next, we will inspect the engine oil. The correct way to inspect the oil is by letting the car sit for a few minutes after the engine is turned off so all the oil can drip back into the oil pan. Remove the dipstick, wipe off and reinsert. The level of the oil should be in between the two dots on the dipstick. The oil can range in color from a clear amber to brown. If the oil looks very dark, smells burnt or it looks like it has metallic flakes in it, then the engine hasn't been maintained very well and there is a good chance there may be internal damage, so you should probably give it a pass. Next up is the automatic transmission fluid. The recommended transmission fluid for this car is Toyota Genuine ATF Type 4. The level needs to be checked after the car has been warmed up, so we will do that after our test drive. To check the condition of the transmission fluid, remove the transmission fluid dipstick and wipe it off on a clean towel. The color of the fluid should be pink if freshly changed, red if it has been driven for a while after a change, and brown if it needs to be changed pretty soon. All of these colors are okay. Next, we move on to the brake fluid reservoir. The level of the fluid should be in between the lines labeled min and max, and the brake fluid should be a light amber in color. Old brake fluid is dark or almost black in color and should be replaced promptly. Having old brake fluid is not good for braking performance as it holds water in it and could also lead to damage of the seals in the braking system. Finally, we have the engine oil filler cap. This is where engine oil is poured in and it sits right above the intake camshaft. Unfortunately, Lexus uses a baffle which makes it very difficult to see if there is any sludge inside the engine from here. However, we can get some other important information from the oil filler cap. This is what the underside of the oil filler cap should look like as it is constantly exposed to oil from within the engine. However, if you see a yellowy or a white looking milky substance underneath the oil filler cap, this could mean one of two things. One, you could have coolant in the engine oil due to blown head gasket. Or two, you could have water build up through condensation in the engine oil. Number two is fairly benign and it is pretty common, especially if the car hasn't been taken on a long drive in a fair amount of time. What happens on short drives is that the oil doesn't get heated up sufficiently and the water vapor that was condensed stays as water within the engine oil. But on a long drive, the oil gets heated up pretty good and this temperature is enough to vaporize the water from the engine oil. Number one, however, is a big no-no. 
A blown head gasket is a very expensive fix. So if you see anything under the oil filter cap which doesn't look like oil, then it's probably best to walk away. There is one final maintenance item that you have to make sure before you can decide whether to buy the GS300 that you're looking at, and that is when the last timing belt service was done. For those of you who don't know, the timing belt is a rubber belt that wraps around the two camshafts and the crankshaft of the engine, and ensures that the valves and the pistons operate in sync. The 2JZ inline 6 cylinder engine in this car is called an interference engine, which means that the valves and the pistons occupy the same space in the engine at different points of time. If the timing belt hasn't been changed in a very long time, then there's a good chance that it could snap. And if this happens, valves and pistons will likely hit each other. And this means that you'll be looking at a new engine or at the very least a rebuilt one. Both these options are very pricey. One way of making sure that the timing belt service has been done is by pulling the car facts for the vehicle and looking for a timing belt service record in the service history. This is an example of what you should be looking for. You can also look for service labels like this under the hood which specify the date and mileage of timing belt replacement. Most of the time, they are located on the air intake box, just like in my case. So if you're looking at a higher mileage GS300 and you can't find any proof for the timing belt service ever having been done, then be prepared to do it as soon as you buy the vehicle if you decide to. You could use this as a bargaining chip to knock a grand or so off of the asking price as that's basically the average price of a timing belt service. Now we're going to start the car up and monitor the exhaust for any smoke. So it's best to have a buddy start the car up while you're at the exhaust looking at it. Let the car idle and look out for any white or blue smoke. Keep in mind that steam is normal especially on cold mornings. It's also good to give the engine a little gas and again look for any kind of smoke. If you have blue colored smoke, that means the engine is burning oil. This could be due to a bad PCV valve, worn valve stem seals, worn piston rings or a blown head gasket. Out of these, the PCV valve is a pretty easy and inexpensive fix. However, finding out the actual root cause for the issue is probably too invasive for most owners to allow before you buy their car, so you probably want to steer clear. If you have white smoke, then the engine is burning coolant. This could be due to a blown head gasket, cracked head or a cracked engine block. These are also very expensive repairs and you should walk away. Now it's time to hop inside the car. The first thing that you need to do is plug an OBD scanner into the OBD port which is located near your left foot when you sit in the driver's seat. After plugging in, turn the key to the third position from the beginning, which is the on position, to read stored trouble codes if there are any. After you're done with the scanner tool, turn the car off completely and then turn the key to the on position and ensure all dashboard warning lights are operational. The tachometer is the leftmost gauge on the dash and is an extremely valuable tool to inspect the two most expensive parts of the car the engine and transmission. Start the car up and observe the RPMs. The needle should settle to between 600 to 800 RPMs pretty quick and remain very steady over there. We will be monitoring the tachometer very closely during our test drive. Shift the car slowly through all the gears. It should shift pretty smoothly without any jerks. The GS300 has a second lower control arm called the caster arm. The bushing in this caster arm is prone to hardening and ripping at higher mileages. You can test this bushing out at the same time you're shifting through the gears. If you hear a creaking sound from outside the car when you shift from park into drive or reverse and the whole car rocks back and forth, then your caster arm bushings are most likely shot. Unlike most common braking systems, the GA300 uses a high pressure nitrogen accumulator and a pump in order to provide the necessary braking effort. If anything goes wrong within any one of these units, the whole unit needs to be replaced. As you can guess, this unit is pretty expensive. To test out the brakes, turn the car on and then disengage the emergency brake using the handle. The brake light on the dashboard should turn off. If it stays on and the fluid level in the brake fluid reservoir is correct, then the brake system is faulty. Next, with your foot on the regular brakes, disengage the emergency brake and shift the car into drive. Let the car creep forward and then depress the brake pedal just enough to stop the car. Hold it firmly for 20 seconds or so. If the brake pedal sinks to the floor, then the brake system is probably faulty. GS300 model years from 1998 to 2000 are known to have faulty brake booster systems which lead to premature failure. 
The subsequent model years from 2001 to 2005 feature a revised design which takes care of this issue. So you may want to stick to these model years in your search. Another very common issue with these cars, especially as they age, is worn engine and transmission mounts. The GS300 has one transmission mount and two engine mounts. They are pretty important components as they are pretty much what hold the engine and the transmission to the chassis. To diagnose bad mounts, with the car idling in park, see if you feel a general vibration around the cabin. If you do, move the gear shifter to neutral and if it goes away, you have bad mounts. The transmission mount is located under the car and is pretty easy to replace. All you need are two jacks and a basic set of hand tools. The motor mounts are considerably harder as there are two of them and you have to jack the motor up in order to replace them. Now would be a good time to make sure all the electronic components within the car are working and in good shape. You want to check the window motors, the side mirrors, the sunroof, the climate controls, especially if you live in Arizona, and finally the door lock actuators. Head on over to the engine bay and listen for any unusual sounds. A healthy 2JZ engine will sound very smooth, so walk away if you hear any ticking, metallic or whining sounds. Belts should not be squeaky and their pulleys should not rattle around where they are mounted. It's time to take the car for a spin. While you test drive the car, it's important to drive as you normally would and also push the car a little so you can judge how well the car was maintained and hopefully expose any lurking issues. You should be monitoring your engine coolant temperature gauge to the right of the dashboard periodically throughout your test drive. It should stay firmly planted at the middle or just below it. First, we're gonna drive on the streets. While giving the car gas, you want to watch it shifting through all the gears on the tachometer on the dash. All the shift should be smooth with no sudden jerks. There should also be no slippage. Slippage is when the engine seems to be revving, but you're not feeling any acceleration. When you slow down, Monitor the tachometer on the dash for the opposite. The needle should drop smoothly. To test the brakes, get the car up to street speed and then hit the brakes firmly to see if you are able to come to a stop straight and quick. Always remember to check your rear view mirror before you do this in order to make sure there is no traffic behind you. Look out for steering wheel vibrations or a squealing sound while braking. These could point to warped rotors and worn brake pads respectively. Make sure that the car tracks straight when the steering wheel is held straight. If it seems to track to one side, it could need an alignment, have uneven tire wear, or worn suspension parts such as tie rods or ball joints. Listen for any creaking or whining sounds while taking turns. If you are hearing a creaking sound, this could be due to worn ball joints or outer tie rods. If instead you are hearing a whining sound, this could be due to low power steering fluid or a failing power steering pump. Next, you need to find a few nice speed bumps so you can test out your shocks and other parts of the suspension. While going over the bump, the car should rise with the bump, descend as it travels downward and then rise up once and settle. If it keeps bouncing, you likely need new shocks. If you hear creaking sounds, it could be worn bushings on the control arms or worn lower ball joints. Having mentioned the phrase lower ball joints twice in the last two minutes, now would be a good time to mention one of the most easily avoidable yet most catastrophic failure events that could occur in a second generation GS300. The lower ball joint connects the wheel to the tie rods and the lower control arm. If the lower ball joint was to fail, you could have anything ranging from major suspension and bodywork to a full-blown accident. The lower ball joints are not very tough to replace and OEM ball joints are not very expensive. So if you have your sights set on a GS300 but have no idea when the ball joints will last change or you don't know if the ball joints are good, do yourself a favor and swap them out. 
We now move from the streets to the highways. This is where we'll really be putting the car through its paces and getting more comfortable with it. A highway merge is a good chance to do some more spirited driving. As you merge into the freeway, push the accelerator pedal all the way to the floor after making sure it's safe to do so. The car should downshift almost instantaneously and you finally get to hear the famous 2JZ growl. Keep monitoring the tachometer as you are putting the driveline under increased stress and trying to uncover any issues. As before, the RPM should rise smoothly and the shift should be almost imperceptible. Keep in mind that it is okay to feel a slightly jerky shift while flooring the accelerator on higher mileage GS300s. What you don't want to hear are weird noises, delayed shifting, or the whole vehicle lurching violently. While cruising at highway speeds, the steering wheel should be steady. If it vibrates a lot, it could point to unbalanced tires, sticking brake calipers, or worn suspension parts. Set a cruise control speed, monitor it, and then turn it off to make sure the cruise control feature is working properly. Now that we've gotten the transmission to normal operating temperature, it's time to check the automatic transmission fluid level. For this, the car needs to be running and placed in park. Make sure that the car is parked on level ground so that you get an accurate reading. Remove the dipstick, wipe it off, and insert it again. Remove it again and note the level. It should be between the marks in the region labeled hot. The color of the fluid would be pink if it was recently changed reddish pink if it was driven for a while after it was changed, or dark brown to almost dark red if it needs to be changed pretty soon. All of these colors are okay. However, if the fluid looks very dark, smells burnt, or looks glittery because it has metallic flakes in it, the transmission probably hasn't been maintained very well and you should give it a pass. Don't forget to check if there are any coolant leaks from where we cleaned it off under the radiator hoses prior to the test drive. So there we have it. I hope this video was helpful to you guys in knowing what to look out for before buying a second generation GS300. These are very solidly built cars, so no matter which direction you want to take them in, they have a ton of potential. And if you come across one with a lot of miles but checks off all the things that I've mentioned in this video, don't be afraid to take the leap. I would love to hear your experience with this car and what kind of plans you have for it in the future, so feel free to comment below. Thanks again for watching and see you next time.